In Galatians chapter 5, Galatians chapter 5, if you want to start turning there. One thing I failed to mention earlier is we also had a ton of people, both kids and counselors, attend youth camp this week. And you can identify them by their light blue shirts. So you'll want to catch them after the service, ask them how it goes, especially the high school boys. Uh, it's, it's to make them feel awkward. No, I, I had a high school boy, yeah. Um, but, uh, but yeah, they had a good time this week, heard good things. Uh, about their time there. So Galatians chapter 5. We're going to start in verse 16 and read through verse 25. So if you will, let's stand for the reading of God's word. The word of the Lord says this. But I say, walk in the spirit and you will not gratify the desires. Walk in the spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the spirit, and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. For those are, these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But of the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with his passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let's pray. Father, we're thankful for your word. And so as we walk through it today, God, we ask that you would work on us in the ways that you see fit. Lord, where we need to be encouraged, encourage us. Lord, where we fall short and we need to be convicted, Lord, convict us so that we can repent and turn back to you. Lord, we pray, if anyone doesn't know you this morning, that through talking about these fruits of the Spirit and the works of the flesh, the gospel be made real. Someone might come to know you this morning. All these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So I want to start by kind of giving an introduction. So I'm, I'm in Galatians chapter 5. If you'll remember last week, Rob was in Galatians chapter 6. We didn't plan that, so... Um, we just kind of ended up in, in a similar spot there as we were thinking through what to do this week. But the big theme of the book of Galatians is the defense of the gospel. Specifically the defense that faith alone in Jesus is where salvation is found. What was happening in the churches of Galatia was that there were people teaching that placing your faith in Jesus was only part of salvation. That the true salvation required following the Mosaic law with all its ceremonies and its requirements. And the particular issue that was rising to the surface was that these teachers referred to as Judaizers were telling the churches that in order to receive salvation, you had to be circumcised as well, which was a requirement under the law. And Paul's response is emphatic. He, he considered this a, a distortion of the gospel that he originally brought to them. And this has largely been a theme of we've walked, as we've walked through the book of Romans. There's been an emphasis just week after week that following the law does not lead to salvation. That salvation is and always has been received by faith. And this goes all the way back to Abraham and the, the first book of the Bible where Abraham believed the promises of God and it was counted to him as righteousness. And the purpose of the law, as we've seen as we've been walking through Romans, was not to provide salvation, but instead show us our need for it. If you remember back to Romans 3, it said, For the works of the law, for by the works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. And that's why we need Jesus to intervene for us. See, Jesus perfectly fulfilled the law and paid the penalty for our sins through his death on the cross. And so as we approach this passage today, Paul is rightfully frustrated as he hears what's going on in these churches. 
and he's spent chapters just addressing how true freedom is not found in the law. See, the law focused on human effort to tame our sinful nature. That's where the rules and the requirements come. Human effort to tame our sinful nature, which that will be referred to as the flesh in our passage today. But true freedom is found in Jesus. And the most precious earthly reward for those who find freedom in Jesus is that the Spirit of God now lives in us. So let's start looking at these passages here. And we'll start with point one if you're a note taker, but it's the battle between the flesh and the spirit. And we see this in verse 16. But I will say, walk by the spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the spirit and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things that you want to do. But if you are led by the spirit, you're not under the law. These, these verses put into words a battle that we continually feel. I know I do. I think you do too. And it's this war between the flesh and the spirit. But in this passage, this, this war is not merely internal, although it definitely is. But rather, the concern here that Paul has front of mind is how we relate to one another. And so the issue in the Galatian church wasn't merely theological, but it was also interpersonal, right? So they had, they had theological problem in that it was not the correct thinking, but they also, that caused an interpersonal problem between one another. And this is why, so we're in verse 16 today, but if you go back to verse 13, these, this is what Paul says immediately preceding this. He says, for you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. So winning this battle benefits not only ourselves in the sense that we're living righteously before God, but it also benefits others. And this was one of the points that I think Rob was hitting on last week as well, is this emphasis on the law being summed up in the phrase, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And specifically, he focused on, uh, or at least primarily in chapter 6, on not growing weary and doing good. And so as we're thinking of what does it mean to walk in the Spirit? Well, one thing that comes to mind that we just read is to walk in love. To walk in love. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. So God is love. So to walk in the Spirit will certainly include that. Both love for God and love for one another, which is how Jesus himself summed up the greatest commandment. So what else does it mean to walk in the Spirit? Well, it means to walk in the guidance of the Spirit the guidance of the Spirit. So while Jesus was teaching on earth, he talked about a promise of the Holy Spirit that would live in believers after he ascended into heaven. He talked about a helper who would come after he left, who would come into our lives. And he described the function of the Spirit in this way. And so if you were to go back to John 16, he says this, when the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, that's Jesus, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. So this is Jesus declaring that the spirit that lives in the believer will guide the believer into all truth. So the spirit that lives in you will guide you into all truth. And so there's an eternal, internal guide pointing believers Uh, in the ways of Jesus, reminding us of the words of Jesus, and instructing us. And you'll notice that there's an imperative here. It tells us that we're instructed to walk in that way. He has to command us to walk in that way. (coughs) So this means that although we're empowered to walk in the Spirit, we also must choose to do so. Right? Did you catch that? We're empowered to walk in the Spirit. It lives in us. The Spirit lives in us. But we also here have to choose to walk in the Spirit. It's like the sword is on the hilt, but it must be drawn for battle. The, the Spirit leads, 
but we must choose to follow. The, the Spirit reminds us of the truth, but we must listen to it. If we were to describe the Spirit as a map, we have to follow it. We can't have the posture of, I know a better way, or listen, my buddy told me about a shortcut and it's way faster. Like, that can't be our posture towards the leading of the Spirit of God in our lives. And the reason we're instructed to walk in the Spirit in these verses is so that we will not gratify the desires of the flesh. And so the, the desires, these desires of the flesh that he's speaking of here are the desires that come from our sinful nature. That although we've received the Spirit as believers, we have not yet been perfected, and we're still in this, and I'm going to use the words from Romans, we haven't quite got there yet because it's in Romans 7, but this body of death. So although we've been saved, we've received the Holy Spirit, our faith is in Jesus, we still live in this body of death, and we still struggle. And so we've seen this in Romans as well. Even though we've been declared righteous, even been described as slaves of righteousness, we still struggle each day to live righteously, right? I mean, maybe it's just me. But we still struggle each day to live righteously, even though we've been declared to be slaves of righteousness. And this can be discouraging. And I don't know about you, but so often it feels like I'm losing this battle. And if there wasn't any way to win in this area, then we would just be distraught. If we couldn't win this battle between the spirit and the flesh, we would be distraught. Really, we would be hopeless. But there is. And the antidote to, to gratifying these desires of the flesh is, in this passage, to walk by the spirit instead. And notice this passage doesn't say walk in the spirit, don't walk in the flesh. It, it doesn't speak of them as a dichotomy. It, it's implied, obviously, that we shouldn't walk and gratify the desires of the flesh, but it reads as if, <coughs> excuse me, walking in the spirit is the part that takes decision and effort. Almost as, as if fulfilling the desires of the flesh is our default mode. And if this is true, then this means we won't naturally coast towards righteousness apart from actively walking in the Spirit. This means then that every day we have to wake up with intentionality, that we have to wake up and acknowledge our need for the Spirit's power. We need to wake up and, 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 and resolve to follow the Spirit's guidance, to actively check our own desires and our own responses to others to determine whether we are walking in the spirit or we're gratifying our own sinful selfish desires and there's an illusion here in verse 17 that our deepest desire truly is to walk in righteousness it is but the desires of the old self make it difficult and paul wants these believers to have victory here and i, and I want us to have victory in this area and verse 18 is telling us why we can have victory. It's because we are no longer under the law. And this is exactly what we've been hearing about. The same encouragement coming from Romans 6. We've spent a lot of time there. Pastor Steve has spent a lot of time through going through Romans 6. But that's where, that's the source of the encouragement and the source of the power to overcome the sinful desires of the flesh. I'm going to give you a bunch of quotes from that very chapter. It says that we're no longer slaves to sin, but we're not slaves to righteousness. We've been set free from sin. We've been, the old self was crucified. The, we are dead to sin now and alive to God. And, and the great promise, sin will no, have no dominion over you. So we have every reason to believe that we can have victory in this battle, in this internal battle between walking in the spirit versus gratifying the desires of the flesh. So, practically, how can we do this? And we have two. We have things not to do, and we have things to do, right? So the first one is, so this is point two if you're a note taker, put away the desires of the flesh. And we see these in verse 19. So to help us understand practically what the desires of the flesh look like, we get a list. It says, now the works of flesh are evident. And we get the, the list, and it says, I warned you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. And as with many, maybe most lists in the Bible, it isn't meant to itemize every possible desire of the flesh. So, so you can't be like, hey, I read that, 
my problem isn't on that list, so I'm good, right? Because at the end of verse 21, it says, and things like these. So you kind of get a junk drawer at the end for everything not mentioned, like all that other stuff that you do, it's in that drawer. Um, it, it's doing a lot of work because we can get pretty creative with the ways that we choose to sin. And even though this list isn't comprehensive, it does provide a pretty wholesome overview of the type of sins that are so common for us to fall to. And so we get the first three that are kind of grouped together. We have sexual immorality and impurity and sensuality. And these are sins that corrupt our own bodies. It's, it's to misuse the gifts our bodies were made for. And then the next two, they kind of are grouped together, is idolatry and sorcery. And these are a perversion of spiritual and supernatural things, ultimately a violation of the commandment to have no other gods. And then we get a long list, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissension, divisions. And these are primarily sins that we commit against one another. And so remember, the issue at hand that's concerning Paul is how the believers of the Galatian church were treating one another. So it shouldn't surprise us that he spends a little time in this category of sins, pointing out things that we are susceptible to. And then the final two, drunkenness and orgies, these are sins of indulgence and abuse of God's gifts. So how does the scripture motivate us to avoid these things? How does the scripture motivate us to not do the, the things on this list and all those things that we stuck in the junk drawer before, if anything came to mind? Well, first, through a warning that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, that should get our attention. So to start, if we believe that we've received salvation, but our lives are characterized by the things that we just read, then we're in danger of being deceived. That's what's meant by not entering the kingdom of God. That instead of receiving salvation like we think we will, in the end we'll be punished eternally for these sins that we've committed. We can't have any confidence that the Spirit lives in us if we continue to act according to the flesh. But many of us are certain in our faith, but we still find ourselves engaged in a battle with the flesh. I think it's important that we frame it that way. There needs to be a battle against the flesh. If we're not, if we're not trying, then that's, that's a problem. But we're engaged in this battle with our flesh. And for us who have placed our faith in Jesus, this should be motivational for us for at least two reasons. First, Jesus had to die for these sins. Jesus had to die for these sins. Like, if we're not subject to eternal judgment, then we were rescued by Jesus. That's the only way we receive rest, is that we were rescued by Jesus. And so our acts of sexual immorality or drunkenness or envy required the death of Jesus for us to be forgiven. Our lapses in judgment caused the spilling of Jesus' blood. And this should not be a small thing to us. See, rightly understood, it should drive us away from those things and not towards them. We should be repulsed by our sin and eagerly ready to repent and turn away from it. Second, to commit these sins is to actively work against the Spirit's work in our lives. And it may be helpful for us to frame our sin in this way. See, as believers, we're on a trajectory. Romans 8, 28 will tell us this. And, I, and you're very familiar probably with the first part, maybe familiar with the second. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And the key part there is this idea that he predestined, he determined beforehand that we would be conformed or molded into the image of his son, Jesus. It is God's plan for you to be molded into something that looks a whole lot more like Jesus and a whole lot less like you are right now. And shortly we'll talk about what that looks like practically, but at a high level, the spirit is actively working in us to make us more like Jesus. So when we sin, 
in a very real way, we are resisting the Spirit's guidance in our lives. We saw the map. We know we're going in the wrong direction. We're just too bullheaded to turn the car around, right? No guy ever does that, right? Like, I'll eventually get there. So, practically, when we feel these feelings of jealousy start to creep in, I'm just going to pick things from this list. These feelings of jealousy start to creep in. We have a choice that we have to make. And so, if in that choice we start to lean into that feeling of jealousy, then we're actively working against what the Spirit is trying to accomplish for us in our lives. When, when life gets difficult, and we're having trouble handling whatever God has laid before us, and that happens, if we run toward things like sexual immorality or drunkenness, we are, are running away from the direction that the Spirit of God is taking us as believers. And this is a big deal. It's, it's the reason why if we persist in those things, we're in danger. How can one love God but continually run away from his good plan for our lives to make us more like his son? So now we know what we shouldn't do, but what should we do? How, how should we handle these temptations? And we do that through point three, pursuing the fruit of the Spirit. Pursuing the fruit of the Spirit. And so now we get a list of what life that walks in the Spirit looks like. So we got all the bad stuff. Now we're going to see what God is producing in our lives. And I'll remind you, it's verse 22 and 23, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Some of you try to sing a song right there. Against such things, there is no law. And the analogy of fruit is used all over the New Testament. We saw it just a few weeks ago in Romans chapter 6. I think it was the last verses we left off before Pastor Steve went to Bosnia. Now that you have been set free from sin, you have become slaves to God. The fruit you get leads to sanctification and in its end, eternal life. And so the fruit is indicative of the source. An apple tree produces apples. And so in this case, a person filled with the Spirit produces these fruit. But because of the battle between the Spirit and the flesh, it's a struggle to continually bear these fruit in our lives. Now, we should be encouraged to know that this isn't entirely on us as the Spirit empowers us to produce fruit. But as we saw above, before, the, the imperative to walk in the Spirit implies personal responsibility as well. We actually see it in verse 25 when it says, if we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. So we have what God is doing in our lives, and we have the personal responsibility to cooperate in that effort in that way, in this particular way. So how do we fight to live a fruit-bearing life. Let me give you the first one, is that God is most honored when our life bears fruit. This is Jesus speaking in John 15. He says, John 15, 8, By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. So Jesus tells us that God the Father is honored through the bearing of this fruit. And so if we want to honor the one who provided this salvation for us, he has explicitly told us a way to do that. Like, if you ever have wondered, like, how can I best honor God? This is a clear answer right here, straight from the mouth of Jesus. How can God the Father be honored? To bear fruit and so prove to be my disciples. Well, second... And it's similar to where we went in the last point. When we fight these battles to bear fruit of righteousness, we are joining the Spirit in His work. So just as earlier we could be resisting His work, here we're empowered to do these fruits because this is the trajectory that the Spirit has us on. So when we struggle with patience, but we choose to practice it, we're working in the direction that the Spirit is working. We're walking in step with the Spirit. When we fight for self-control, we're not working alone. The Spirit is working alongside us. When we engage difficult people and we choose to do so with kindness, we're both honoring God and displaying to those people that were His disciples. 
And in all these things, we have a model. And that's the earthly ministry of Jesus. Don't we see the joy of Jesus in his ministry? I mean, Hebrews reminds us that it was the joy that moved him to, it was his joy that moved him to endure the cross. Don't we see the peace of Jesus as he calms the raging sea right after a good nap? The patience of Jesus to serve with 12 men who even at the end of his ministry didn't still quite get it as they're arguing about who among them will be the greatest. Or the kindness of Jesus to serve and eat with those who were considered outcasts in society. The goodness of Jesus and the compassion that he showed to the sick, healing them of their ailments. His faithfulness in following his father's plan for redemption, even though it was going to lead to his very death. His gentleness as he calls the little children to come and sit with him. His self-control and not lashing out against his enemies as they beat him. All powerful. He could have just destroyed them in a second, but he doesn't. It wasn't part of the Father's plan. And then above all, his love as displayed in his substitutionary death on the cross. And these are the traits that are being molded in you. And it's a worthy endeavor to pursue them. And it's also one that will make your salvation sure. So let me end with this. Um, the culture that we live in sends us all kinds of messages about how we should live. You know, things like, man, the only thing, the only way to get things done is you gotta be loud and abrasive. You know, it's, or, or maybe it's something like, you know, it's, it's okay to get a little crazy sometimes. Like, that's not bad, right? Every once in a while. Or, you know, nice guys finish last, man. You got to make it happen. Or, listen, man, eye for an eye. They got you. You get them back. Or, or just, you know, that person's dead to me. Like, they can't be forgiven. And sometimes when I read this list of fruits, I'm concerned that they aren't actually traits that we aspire to. I find that in myself. And, and, and more honestly, probably more often, it's not that we don't aspire to all of them, but certainly there's some in here that we have trouble aspiring to. And too often we take our cues from the messaging that our culture gives us and not from the scripture. Like, do we really aspire to be the kindest person that we know? I don't know. Maybe some of you do. I don't know that I, 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 don't know that I always do. Do we... Do we really want to be the most self-controlled person on the planet? Would we love to be that person, just the most self-controlled? Do, do, we, do we wake up in the morning and decide that, you know what, I want to be a person of peace today? No, we choose violence. Do we, do we always aim to always respond to others with patience? Like, is that our goal? Is that what we want to be? Would we be courageous enough to, know, to be known as a person who's just known for ha having a self-sacrificing love for others? And, and do we applaud and appreciate people who are gentle and kind or joyful or all of these things, self-controlled and kind? Like, do, do people who exemplify like a consistent joy, are those the people that we find attractive and, and want to emulate as they emulate Christ? So my goal here isn't actually to make us feel bad. <laughs> it, and, and I'm guessing you, like me, like frequently fall short of this kind of resolve in our lives. I just, I just don't think about it like I should. But my goal in walking us in this direction as we conclude is, is, is not to make us feel bad, but instead to reorient the goalposts, right? To, to remind us which direction we should be running at. I think it's probably my favorite G.K. Chesterton quote of all time. It goes like this. He says, progress should mean that we are always changing the world to fit the vision. Instead, we are always changing the vision, right? So we struggle with scope creep, if you're familiar with that term. 
that we, we kind of get off track of where we need to be. And so when we read about the fruit of the Spirit, it can reorient us to, to keep our eyes fixed on what we're becoming, and that's something that looks more like Jesus. And so taking G.K. Chesterton's quote, what does progress look like in the Christian life? Well, progress in the Christian life is growth towards looking like Jesus. And so let's not settle for anything different than that. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word and how it corrects us and, and God, how it convicts me and how it, how it reorients my vision. And so, Lord, as we go through these verses today, I just pray that we'd all be reminded of, of what it looks like to walk in the Spirit, to exemplify these fruits. And Lord, I pray that we would all be inspired to, to do that all the more through the, through the power of the Holy Spirit. Lord, thank you for Jesus who even makes that possible. His death to save us results, among other things, the Spirit living in us and guiding us and walking us through life. And so, Lord, help us remember that we're not alone as we aspire to faithfulness. Help us to be encouraged knowing that you never leave us or never forsake us, but you only have our good in mind. God, you work all things together for good. All this we ask in Jesus' name.